on the dot and now under than one. We will let you know when it's 200 so there is no pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. I get nervous. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So Doris, I'll let you get us started with um, the overview of what we're doing. So welcome to everyone to the number, I don't know what number of webinar it is. Uh, so delighted to have you to our weekly webinar to receive updates. And today I am absolutely thrilled to have as a special guest, uh, Dr. Jeff Powis, um, who is the Chief of Infection Prevention and Control at Michael Garron Hospital. And I do need to tell you, he has been one of the key people to whom I resort when I have questions about PPE, questions about things that I'm not sure I trust very much as someone is saying to me, so I compare notes. So the silver lining actually to me of uh, COVID-19 has been that I have met some amazing, amazing individuals that serve as a sounding board and one of them is Jeff. So thank you, Jeff. And we will go from here to your very brief presentation first and then we yeah. have so many questions and I'm sure many more that will be coming. We have so far 125 people. I told you, I will tell you when it's 200 <laughs> to increase the pressure and it's All going right. very quickly up. This is like a thermometer. Okay, okay. well, that's, that's exciting. It, it, it's great to have, uh, have an audience. And I, I, I wanna start just by uh, talking a little bit about, you know, Doris echoed about the relationships that have been created through, through this. And I would say that, um, working with, with RNAO and, and seeing the work that you guys have been doing and the, the focus on collaboration and working together is really what I think is gonna be the legacy of COVID-19 about what we can accomplish when we all work together to one shared goal. And I'm excited, this is a horrible, horrible thing and I hate working every minute I'm awake and um, hate to see all the horrible things that are happening to people. But what I tr keep remembering about is that uh, the relationships and the work that we're doing together to build these responses are gonna do wonders for, for us moving forward as we, we focus on future public health uh, emergencies. Maybe the only thing I could add before you get started, just yeah. to put in context to people, you may remember uh, some of you at least that participated in previous webinars and pre-COVID webinars, and Jeff will not know this, that before COVID we used to have also the webinars and they were all focused on OHTs and health system transformation, yeah. Jeff. And Susan McNeil, who, Susan, you need to wave, and myself are working on the OHTs, Ontario Health teams, BPSOs, and Michael Garron Hospital, alongside many, many other partners are one of the OHTs that we are formally engaged with as a best practice spotlight organization. And just a comment that I don't think I have made uh, to you, Jeff, uh, but yes to the Premier and the Minister, that the OHTs already proved themselves. Uh, ah. They came into testing, not through the um, not through the testing of COVID, but they came into testing with COVID. Uh, and if anybody was thinking how we will evaluate OHTs, well, they have passed the test ahead of time. And um, I have been tremendously impressed, just so you know, for the colleagues on, on the webinar, that the OHTs, most of them, at least the ones we are involved, are, are holding weekly webinars some of them twice a week uh, with their partners. And very similar to what you will see today with Jeff answering to us, it's just fascinating to see how he helps absolutely every partner, whether it's the um, Riverdale Community Health Center or whether it is with any of the partners, VHA and others, uh, to help problem solve the issues that they are experiencing on COVID. So you start to see really the role much more fulsome. And um, we will talk later on about our eco model and what we are asking there. And I think what you will hear from Jeff will augment some of what we will be speaking if we get to it and if not next week. Yeah, for all sure. You, 
on yours, Jeff. Okay. I mean, Doris, you're 100% right about, uh, I think having one unified goal has really united OHTs. And uh, I keep telling my colleagues that I, I've been able to do things because of my OHT model that I could never have dreamt of doing before. So we'll get on to the, and again, it's a very short presentation. I'll focus mostly on the questions that you've answered, asked and do my best to answer them. But I'm going to give you a disclaimer right now is that I only can <laughs> know what is known. And uh, what I knew when this started is different than the knowledge that is now out there. Things are rapidly evolving. And th that's amazing. Things are rapidly evolving at a pace that allows us to create new knowledge, but it also is rapidly evolving at a pace that requires us to really try and distill that knowledge and provide you with what I consider my best evaluation of all of this knowledge to answer your questions. And so my assessment of the evidence may be somewhat different than another expert, but I'm doing my best to, to assess uh, the evidence and give you the best evidence-based answer. So next slide. So I would say this weekend, despite the beautiful weather, was a little bit disheartening to me. As we talked a little bit about opening up the, the province, this has been a, a topic that many people have been talking about. I, I think in relation to the the balance of the public health message to reduce the number of COVID cases with the political pressure to open up the province and get the economy going again. And when the province put together its, uh, its uh, recommendation as far as when we can start to ease some of the public health message, they had four major criteria that they wanted us to look at. And these were what they considered to be requirements to moving forward and, and increasing from phase one to two to three in a sequential approach. So when you look at some of these things, um, there are a few things that I wanted to address specifically. And a lot of this has to do with how well do I think we're doing these things so that we can actually deal with this and get forward with real life. Appreciating that if we do it poorly, we're gonna to have to take two steps back. So I wanted to focus particularly on the health system capacity. And I would say that the one thing that from my perspective has been a silver lining in this crisis has been the hospital's response to this crisis. And I think that is related to a infrastructure investment after SARS. So SARS, as you all remember, 17 years ago, I was had lots of black hair and a resident back then, is that uh, the legacy from SARS was a infection control practitioner per 100 patients acute care beds. And what that has done is that has left us in Ontario with world-class hospital-based infection prevention and control. We, I was talking to colleagues about how to plan for this on January the 15th. I think Doris was doing a BPSO spotlight thing here in like, early yeah. February and I grabbed her and said, well, what are we going to do about this, Doris? I remember. So, so that is the silver lining is I think the hospital part of things, we were well organized. We had plans in place. The, the supply chain issue, I think we perhaps could have done better with, but for the most part, I think we did a good job with, with the health system response. We've we'll got the public health messaging around virus spread and containment. I, I think in in many ways that hit well. I think we were lucky because people saw the messages in relation to New York, um, Italy, and uh, images out of, of China before us, so that people were intrinsically motivated to listen to the public health messages. And so I, I do think we did a pretty good job of these first two things. Really what those were meant to do is buy us time for the other two things to actually fulfill their mandate. And in my mind, this is where we need to focus our future work as a system in order to try and move forward with living with the virus because it's not going to go away. And for me, it's this capacity to have a robust public health system that can adequately do contact tracing and snuff out outbreaks before they actually happen. And that's where I want to focus on our future uh, slides. Next slide. So this is what people have done. This is a mobility data that you get from cell phones. You can get this, uh, it's, a, it's a public source. You can you grab it, uh, Google has it or Apple has it. 
we have an epidemiologist that works with us that uses this to try and develop a mechanism to predict well what's coming in the proceed in the next coming weeks as far as cases to our um, hospital and you can see that that people started relaxing their social distancing and travel even before the province indicated that it was okay and the red and, and, and yellow lines are in relation to driving and walking you can see people are still quite hesitant to get back on transit likely related to the close physical space shared with other transit riders but you can see that even before it was officially opened up we were starting to move a lot more and what I saw this weekend, uh, I, I really believe is reflective of this. It involves the public being a bit unwilling to continue with social isolations because things look quote unquote good. And um, warm weather, which would drive any Canadian out of their house mm -hmm. in the springtime. So I think it's those two things. And I've seen many cases this weekend our case counts are increasing in the hospital we've unfortunately had increasing numbers in our icu and i, I worry that we've uh, moved forward with some of our mobility before the province was ready with respect to case counts remember we wanted to drive things down as far as possible in order to reduce the pool of virus to make it manageable from a public health perspective so next slide so what I, and again, this only goes to May 22nd, um, but this tail on the end of new cases, this is Ontario new, new cases per day. You can see the, the trend, and that trend has continued to have an upward uh, scope. Um, on, on the <laughs> Majin, put the, put the mute there, Majin. Oh, I thought it was. <laughs> That's so. fine. Yes. Coughing's a, coughing's a social sin now. Okay. It's a social sin. <laughs> so, uh, so um, you can see the red line, unfortunately, ha has continued to, to increase as, as we move forward this week, which again reflects what happened two weeks ago, maybe uh, you know, Mother's Day activity, but even just you can see in those lines, people got more relaxed um, with respect to their uh, movement and their activity. So next slide. So why have I put a picture of a forest fire? Because for me, this is the perfect analogy as to what we should use for a public health response. And so when there is a enormous blaze in a forest fire that you, you do everything you possibly can to try and snuff it out. And so from my perspective, that was what the public health messaging was about. Everybody stay at home, nobody within six feet, stay with inside your bubble. That was meant to drive this down to something that was then manageable. And there afterwards, the firefighter's job is to, 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 to keep the place wet and deal and look for these hot spots that are emerging and we douse them with water before they emerge into another fire and i think that uh, this is where i'm a bit disappointed in what has not been done from a system perspective next slide so these are what i think are success fire factors moving forward and um Unfortunately, I think the political will, um, it was there initially with respect to our public health measures, but it did fade as the balance from economic pressures to get things going again uh, proceeded. I, I think we are challenged living next to the United States where the message has been very different. And because things looked pretty good, there were low numbers in hospitals, we thought we were heading in the right direction, but, but I want to caveat that, that we weren't actually looking hard enough for how much infection was in the community. Remember that only a minority of patients are presenting to the hospital. And in order to truly know what my community rate was, I would have needed to, to, to do broad-based testing before this time to know actually what is the residual viral load of my community. And I think we've underestimated how much virus was left. And by opening up too early, it allows for secondary transmission. Progressive case finding is, in my mind, the key. If you think about, uh, you know, the South Koreas of the world, the New Zealands of the world, the places, you know, Iceland that has done really, really well, um, they have robust public health systems that have been empowered to aggressively case find, do contact tracing, and aggressively test around contact tracing. And case management, in my mind, is really where then we leave it to the health professionals to, 
to focus on how we best manage or support a case as it's been found. And this is where I think that we need to make huge rapid investments. And I'm struggling, maybe you guys can help me figure this out, is how do we do this in the most efficient way? Do we work within the existing framework of public health that hasn't been able to respond? Or do we try to do something different or better using an OHT model? And that's where I'm conflicted right now as far as how do I best proceed with this. But this is what we need to do, and we have to do it quickly. And I'm saying, Jeff, you don't need to be conflicted. Read echo. <laughs> it's right there. What, what you're thinking is written right there. Because I don't think, just a comment, I don't think it's only an issue of investment. I am going to be much less polite than you. I also think it's an issue of leadership. Yeah, I think um, David's shoveling fog comment was uh, bang on as far as uh, describing that we've really been spinning our wheels um, with respect to uh, public health and again, pushing them to try and come up with explain to me, well, what, the, what is their plan? How are they going to get us through this? It has left me with some disillusionment and drive to do it through my OHT. Um, appreciating that many of my colleagues say, Jeff, don't do it because you're going to force us to then do it. So I'm trying to figure out the balance between doing someone else's job because it needs to be done versus maximizing the OHT. But we can talk about that balance moving forward. And the other thing that, uh, that we did do early within OHT, and again, uh, many of our health resource partners have, have done this, is, is, is putting a wall around vulnerable populations. I'd like to increase the size of that fence, to be honest. And if we're gonna use testing, rather than the most common reason for our testing in our community assessment center today was because Doug Ford sent me in, I'd rather use the testing in, in a more robust way and, and perhaps have an active surveillance testing system for healthcare workers who work in long-term care homes. These people aren't going anywhere. This is being brought to them. And I would like to use testing in a more proactive approach in order to really put a large picket fence around my long-term care homes, retirement homes and other vulnerable individuals. And again, I think that's where we again can think about if there is testing capacity rather than um, pissing out the window, as my grandmother would say, it'd be better to use it in, in a wise and uh, systematic way. And the last thing is that um, the flexibility of an OHT allows us to modify and iterate approaches that's not working. And that's where I see public health hampered by looking for a system solution across the entire province when, when the realistic thing is this is a GTA problem in Ontario. This is not a large problem in other parts of the, uh, of the province. Their public health systems seem to have been able to do much better with this compared to GTA. When I see that, it does question why has Toronto Public Health failed so poorly? Is it related to leadership, um, lack of resources, or a combination of both? But again, whatever response we come up with, we need the flexibility to adapt to what we find and perhaps blow up what isn't working called creative destruction. Okay, next slide. And uh, again, this is my, my, my uh, it drives me crazy. I don't know why he does this to me whenever it's a sunny weekend, but uh, it comes out with, with weekend uh, press conference bombs that uh, require us to completely rejig the way we've been doing things and, and haven't given us a time to uh, to prepare. So I 100% agree with a strategy of more broad-based testing. But the reason nobody was testing in Ontario, and particularly in Toronto, if you look at the testing volumes, the decreases are predominantly in Toronto, is because nothing happens when the tests are done. We are one of the few groups that actually follow up patients who have testing that is positive. We speak to every one of them. We do our best to contact trace so they don't have the authority to do it the way public health and all the database that public health has. But I know many centers are testing and nothing, these results go into the nether. And as clinicians, we all test for a purpose. I do a CBC in somebody because I think there's a problem. I do a COVID test because I think they need one. So to test for testing sake when we don't think anything is happening with the results, that's why nobody's testing. It's not that we don't believe in broad-based testing. We need to build the system in order to utilize it more appropriately. 
And also, Jeff, uh, let's remember that the testing criteria was very narrow, extremely narrow, faultily narrow, yeah. delusional narrow, and it has changed, thankfully. So until people will catch up to even understand that it has changed, we have many, many colleagues, health professionals that were denied testing with symptoms. Yeah. No, I agree with you. The testing was very um, rigid in, in the first place. What I would have preferred, if the is that, that uh, the ministry reach out to all of us and say we would like to expand testing to asymptomatic individuals, and, and, and how would you best like to do that within your OHG? Um, rather than spending them with, uh, you know, there's people down there who just came in and said, well, I came in because I saw the news conference and thought I should come in, but they have been self-isolating for 14 days with no known exposures. So it becomes, it becomes a, a, a rational use of a limited resource. And it, it is still a limited resource. If we drive testing up too high, we will start getting into the length of, of testing delay, at which we know the risk of transmission is greatest in the five days preceding symptom onset, five days after. If your delay in the lab is five days, you might as well not even have done the test because you have no capacity to change the risk of secondary infection, what we call the R0. And so here are my opportunities. So the same investment you made in hospitals, that needs to be done in long-term care retirement homes. So I promise you, I can save lives, not from COVID-19, but from every communicable disease that exists in long-term care, if the system makes the same investment in the long-term care homes in my neighborhood. I've now built the relationships. They trust us. They realize we're all working together towards the same goal, is that if we could make the same investment, we could have lead, world-leading long-term care infection prevention control, not just hospital-based infection control. Um, I feel like I'm talking to the converted about the OHTs and, and, and leveraging existing community linkages, so I won't speak too much about that. So I, I feel like I am preaching to the converted in that respect. And the last is that, uh, you know, it, it's going to require some innovative thinking. And that takes risk. It takes trying things that no one's done before. And it takes the, the willingness to fail. And so I always tell everyone in my own OHT is that uh, if you're not willing to make a mistake, we're never going to get forward. And I think somebody's just going to take a stab at how to do contact tracing and broad-based testing the population well and try. Because you know what? Right now, nobody's even trying. So I'll leave it on that and uh, move forward for questions. For the and we did promise you we will tell you when it's over 200 and we are over 200. Yeah, great. Exactly for the question. Perfect. So I don't know if we want to do Nora's questions related to the presentation and then the pre-submitted questions or how you want to... So, so I, I do want to make a comment um, on, on in terms of what our new things would think or comment on your comments, which we are totally on the same page on the capacity of hospitals. You know, interestingly enough, when people kept saying the system didn't crumble, the system didn't crumble, the system completely crumbled. The only thing that didn't crumble is hospitals. Yeah. The rest, really, primary care hardly continue. It continued a bit virtual, but they didn't have PP to continue. Home care couldn't get into the homes because of no PP, no testing. A long-term care, I don't need to tell you what happened. And public health was uneven. Some places did great, some places did, quite frankly, very poorly. So we, we still, and still OHTs work better I will be curious, and, and we can talk later on, on what happened in places that there is no OHD, period, none, right? It will be interesting to look. But uh, the issue of building long-term care with COVID, with OHD or without, is a must because uh, it was abandoned. It's a sector that was completely, totally abandoned by the health system, both poly, from a policy perspective, from a resource perspective, uh, it, it really is tr it's a tragic story. And although it happened in some other countries, um, in Ontario and Quebec, you know, we win the prize for Canada in a bad way. Yeah, I know. You know, Doris, when I look back at it, and you know, I saw the images of them hosing down that long-term care home in Spain. And you know what? I didn't think it was my job, and I, I bear that. 
Uh, we went out as early as, I, you know, I went out on March the 27th when I saw my first case, a colleague in Veterans Center in Sunnybrook told me about their case. I said, I got to go out to long-term care. But I, sh you know, if somebody would have said it was my responsibility, I promise you, so, so those eight homes we got to, one was already an outbreak. The other seven have remained green. And then we got to two late that are already both an outbreak. Right, like th there was a, a huge opportunity early, but I didn't think it was my job as a hospital-based infection control. But, but we did, but Jeff, we did that renewal. And when you look at our, at, at our reactions, we actually said that PP needed to go to nursing homes before hospitals because we knew residents in nursing homes didn't have a chance. But, but, but the system as a whole didn't go there. Yeah, no, it was March 27th. I remember very clearly the day we sent out masks to everyone and said universally mask and then tried to implement prevention strategies thereafter. And we issued the call at the beginning of March for universal masking. And we said the first sector that needs to get the PPE is nursing homes. And of course, hospitals being hospitals, they were the first to actually uptake that call way before a, David Williams uh, put the call out. Uh, but nursing homes, if you remember, was only after an outbreak. Testing after an outbreak, mask after an outbreak. And when you look at why Kingston did so well, Kingston did universal masking first, directed by their medical officer of health, a very quiet but very diligent, competent person. Yeah. They did first the nursing homes. Yes, I've. Two of my best friends live in Kingston, and they tell me stories of what a competent chief medical officer of health can do, and it's incredible. Yeah. See, one of the comments in the said, you know, some health jurisdictions have been doing well. Are you talking about Toronto? And uh, all my opportunity comments with respect to public health are directed uh, towards Toronto of public health, as far as an opportunity for improvement. I, I, again, I hear about the wonderful things they're doing in Kingston, and that's why, as well, when I talk about a flexibility of a plan. I think Directive 2 is, is a bit short-sighted in that there are opportunities to catch up on some of the work in, in other places of the province that are not uh, struggling with community spread, um, such as Kingston and other areas of, of, the, of the province. So I don't think Directive 2 should be um, a universal blanket. It, it's easy from a policy decision to make it universal, um, but it doesn't work in a complex province like Ontario with different dynamics and different quality public health needs. Yeah. Okay. So Heather and Irma Jean and Susan, you want to drive questions? Sure, yes, people are eager to ask questions. Sure. Um, and so maybe we'll start in the category of treatment and okay. testing. Um, and the, there were a couple of questions based on your presentation about testing. Okay. So I just wondered, Liz was wondering if there was anything else you thought um, is the problem with widespread testing. Is there anything more you want to say about that? And also she's wondering, does not the testing go to the family doctor? I'm thinking she probably means the results. Yeah, so uh, I'll t tell you what I want to build and you guys can tell me if you think it's a good idea. So I would love a distributed model across a group related to an OHT. Um, we have four community hubs in our OHT. I'd like each of them to go find me 100 people a day to test. And then I'd like to have a mobile team that I would send out based on the epidemiology from case finding to go test around. Uh, you know, I, I, I know there's a lot of laws at Musgrave, for example, that have a case. I'd like to go test, open up a big parking lot tent and test everyone coming out of that uh, Musgrave uh, law laws. And then use that to drive down the infection rate by finding everyone who might be positive and teaching them what to do. And then the next day, I might go to the, uh, these are all the places in, in East York, if people are wondering to, to, you know, to the Iqbal Foods or something like that. And so that's, that's my vision, including the community assessment center at the hospital. And then using epidemiology to drive subsequent testing, but the ultimate goal of just driving down r not. I think each hub in our OHT, and probably the same in most of them, have their own mechanism for testing. And so I've asked each of ours to look out to how they do their testing. They can facilitate their own testing. We'll just have to coordinate the back end of it, either at public health do the contact tracing, or what, what may need to happen is we may need to do it our, ourselves to get it done the way I'd like it to, to be done. 
So I, I 100% want more broad-based testing. What I like is a layer of planning so that it is done with purpose. So I want to do, I, I'd love them to give me 5,000 tests for East York to use a week. But uh, again, it would have to be done with purpose and the results would have to drive subsequent performance. Um, where I went to test, drive down the R-naught. Otherwise, we're just testing for testing's sake. Great, thank you. Um, so can you just talk about um, protocols for who to test? Uh, there's a question, it's um, this one here in long-term care. Everyone got swabbed as a mandatory protocol. Yeah. Uh, it's not happening in hospital or paramedics. What about home care? Any thoughts yeah. on that? So uh, th that was part of a, a long-term care initiative to test broadly in long-term care homes. Um, I could say that it, it, it was conflicting value. We have 10 long-term care homes. Um, I could tell you that it did not find any problems I didn't know existed al already. And it confirmed that my high-performing long-term care homes are high-performing long-term care homes and they didn't have any cases amongst their staff or patients. So it was interesting from a surveillance perspective to know how much was in long-term care. It did require quite a challenging resource investment. So public health doesn't send anybody to swab. I usually had to find some additional resource to do the swabbing. So how would I have done it differently? I, I would have uh, swabbed based on where there was concern, either based on the inability to put in prevention measures or whether there were cases or concerns about clusters of cases single staff positivity, swab all the staff, all the residents, that's easy. So use more a, uh, a response-driven testing strategy. Mm -hmm. but, think... but Jeff, with that, you would have started probably also in advance the universal masking of staff coming to the homes and not working in three places as they do. Yeah, but I mean, even in our homes where we were able to get in and put robust uh, prevention strategies, those that have, have remained well, right? it was a matter of putting in those robust infection prevention control strategies. And so to be honest, testing in those groups, because they, they send about five tests a week. I know they're doing symptom assessments because they actually are sending five tests per week. I tell Jared Rosenberg, the geriatrician is running this with me. If a home stops sending tests, it means they're not doing symptomatic assessments. I mean, you look at the screening criteria in long-term care or, or even anywhere when to do a test, you know, progressive functional decline. I keep joking, when I come in on Monday, I need a new COVID test because I have functional progressive decline from the previous <laughs> day. So, so the testing threshold was so low, you should be sending five to 10 tests per week from a 100, 150 bed long-term care home. So we use that as a performance metric. So if you're sending that many per week and they're all negative, to me, that is a perhaps a wiser way of using the resource. I would like to know more about shelters and uh, I would rather than testing all of them do positive residents and or positive staff test the entire facility and then take a sampling from other shelters across the system, get a sense of what's going on and then follow up uh, tests if they are positive. But I do think we need to do more of a sentinel so we can repeat it over and over again rather than just this one time assessment of everyone. That would be my bias if I were going to swab other vulnerable populations. So low threshold and then do it in a purposeful surveillance type process. Great, that's really helpful. And I think you're answering some of the questions that people mm -hmm. are, are putting into the chat box. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about false negatives, false positives. Yeah. So uh, every test has problems with false negatives and false positives. And uh, this test is, is, is not immune to those. False negatives is a far greater concern of mine than false positives. Mm -hmm. um, false negatives, um, we need to remember, one of my mentors told me, remember Jeff, it's just a test, treat the patient. So somebody, you think somebody has COVID and the test is negative, they probably have COVID and you should treat them as such and consider retesting them. And I know many hospitals that all of you would work at or other institutions have a policy whereby they wouldn't discontinue precautions when there's a high clinical probability, they would keep the person in precautions and test again. And so I think, um, that's my assessment that if you think it's COVID, it's probably COVID. And if the test is negative, it's likely false negative. Consider repeating it 24 hours later. False positives, we've had about three that I can think of. 
each of them didn't make sense to me. So it was a, on our long-term care screening, all the staff, all the residents are negative. Said one 91 year old person who was positive, <laughs> been in the home forever. They had no symptoms at any time. And it didn't make any sense because if there was a one person with COVID on a long term, usually the roommate at least would have become positive. We might have got a sense of another positive staff member or someone else. And so we repeated their test. It was negative, repeated again, it was negative. That was a true false positive. And so people ask me, well, how does a PCR have a false positive? So a PCR, for those of you who don't have, you know, have to go back to, to school to remember how PCR works, is it it has a primer that is a, a series of nucleic acids that attaches to something that it binds to based on electrostatic charge. It looks for something that, that looks like it, binds, and then replicates it millions and millions and millions of times. So it's a very, very sensitive test. But it can find rarely things that aren't what it's looking for and start replicating. And that's when you get into challenges with false positives. Either some other collection of nucleic acids that's uh, related to something within the body itself or, or, or circulating something that looks like that because again is electrostatic charge. So it, it can can happen. Again, we've probably done tens, not hundreds of thousands of tests and I've seen three. So it is uncommon. So false negatives, much bigger concern than false positives. Great. That's a really helpful answer, Jeff. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one more question in this section um, because I think RNAO has some of the answers to those other ones and then move to the vaccine. Okay. Um, so about swabbing, is swabbing a sufficient method of testing? And if someone is asymptomatic, how long would a swab remain an effective way to determine if they had COVID? Okay. So I, I think the question is really getting at is, you know, what are the ways to know if somebody has or has had COVID. So a, a nasopharyngeal swab looks for the nucleic acids of the virus. So the first thing to think about with that swab is that you can be exposed and incubating and you will have a negative test. It doesn't mean you won't get COVID-19. And sometimes I think people are putting so much weight into testing as far as pre-surgical, where they're not thinking about the fact that they could still get it. And some literature looking at pre-surgical patients talks that the reason pre-surgical screening isn't of great value is because people are incubating it when they hit the door. So between the time you're exposed and actually develop symptoms, um, well, not even to symptoms, but before the virus is, is in large enough amounts in your body, your, your test is going to be negative. So you should, after an exposure, between four to eight days is the ideal time to get tested. Don't get tested before four days. So if anyone does have a worry about an exposure, don't run and go get tested. You know, Ford turned everyone from Trinity Bellwood to go to the testing center today. He obviously <laughs> doesn't know about incubation periods and window periods, right? Like he should have waited four days before they came to get their testing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first thing about the, the, the test. And then once it is positive, I believe about 72 hours, they're pre-symptomatic, then they develop symptoms, and then it remains positive for a prolonged period. And the analogy I give to my patients is that even when you're better, so 14 days have passed post-symptom onset, you feel amazing, 100% back to yourself for 72 hours. The test will still likely be positive. And what that indicates is dead virus. And I tell them that they fought a body inside, sorry, a war inside their body, and they won. And they're just kicking out the dead bodies. It's just the dead virus. And I have patients that are still positive. I don't know why they're getting tested because I tell them not to at 65 days, 70 days post infection. It's not live virus. There's lots of studies to show us that. So what would I like to do to know somebody is now post symptomatic if it was actually COVID or not. So they're better, the test is negative, but they had something that might've been COVID. That's when we want a serologic study. And so we are doing some stuff. We're hoping in June to, to look at a serologic test. We're, we're doing some research in uh, healthcare providers regarding serologic tests. But that is the what I'm very excited about for people who think, well, I might have or did I have. And that's where I would like to do more broad-based healthcare worker testing is using serology um, and then use the, the, the PCR test to do outbreak investigations and uh, symptomatic testing. So that's, you know, I've answered that in a long-winded way, but there's two types of tests and I'd use them in different ways. Actually, uh, Susan, before you move on, and I'm hoping you haven't uh, 
answered this, but the question is related to why there are different lengths of time for testing results to come back. That yeah. in the hospital, it's four to 12 hours. Outside, it seems to be seven to 10 days. Yeah, so um, there are many things that go between the time you shove the swab in the nose and the result shows up on your EMR. So it's packaged, you label it. There's a courier process. So for our lab, our lab is offsite. So we had to increase the frequency of our courier pickups to get a rapid turnaround time. It then goes into a central um, uh, depository where, where, where things are uh, accessioned. And uh, public health, um, that is a, is a real uh, log jam for them. They have lots of tests. Mm -hmm. They're trying to organize where they're going. And public health, to meet the um, capacity that has been required, they also had to subcontract testing to other organizations. And that's where I think the wait list, the wait time, the turnaround time, we call it, has increased quite markedly. So it goes to public health. Public health doesn't have the capacity to do it. They send it to another lab. They do it. Results go back to public health and then back to the healthcare provider. And it's all these uh, additional yeah. subcontractors that are lengthening the, uh, the, the, the time. So what would I do to try and improve it? As I would uh, try to make it so that everybody works with their own lab to get the results quickly. So for example, as we quote unquote, open up healthcare services, every primary care office should reach out to where their labs are done to see how they're getting them done that expeditiously. So every lab now has capacity to do this. It's PCR tests. It's, you know, somebody who, you know, anybody who's gone to, to, to university and done something about chemistry can run a PCR test. And even that point of care ones that are just like, look like you, you know, you, it looks like an inkjet cartridge you just shove into a machine that can do it as well. And so, it, it really comes down to the processing times and the administration as to why there's variable lengths of stay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And the labs are not at 100% capacity to this point. 80% capacity. Um, what's his name? Uh, Goal. It's, he called me one day desperate of why they're not being used. Thank you. Uh, so can we move on to vaccine questions? There sure. was one in the added to this, but really people are wondering yeah. about, um, in general, vaccines take many years to develop normally. And uh, so how safe and effective can a vaccine be if it's developed in such a short time frame is what some are proposing? Yeah. How is this going to affect um, nurses in terms of vaccine education? And then is there possible, like, do we know if we would need to be vaccinated every year? Yeah, so um, I'll take those are two separate questions. I'll do the they next are. year, the, the year one later. Um, there has never been such a, 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 a search for some prize by so many people at the same time. And uh, from a bioethics perspective, we're going to have to weigh speed with precision and safety. And I think that's what we have to hold our. Um, the FDA, Health Canada, to keep us um, balancing that appropriately. Um, there are a ton, I mean, there's a great New York uh, Times article about the ethics of vaccine production. And um, it, it, it's actually fascinating to think about, well, who, let's say Canada discovers a vaccine. It, we should use a One Health approach, but will we nationalize it? Who knows, right? There, there's so many interesting things about a vaccine and where it is first developed. I know India, who has uh, one of the largest vaccine producers, says that they do develop a vaccine, they will, they will nationalize it and vaccinate their entire population before it will be taken outside. So, so I do think we need to balance speed with safety. And how is that going to deal, how are you going to deal with that at the front line as a, as a nurse? I hope by the time it gets to you, there will be at least a balanced discussion about those risks and benefits that you can synthesize and transfer that to your patients in a way that's translatable to them. Um, we have had bad experiences with rushes to vaccine in the past, swine flu vaccine, for example, um, and, and we're gonna have to balance uh, speed with, uh, with, with safety. And uh, with such a pressure for vaccine, that's gonna be a, a, a tough balance. There's something to get to phase three and fail because of uh, transverse myelitis. Um, 
we as a society are going to have to make a balanced risk benefit discussion about that. Is that adverse risk event at two in a million tolerable for the benefit? So that's the, I mean, I'm asking, I'm answering that from a, an ethical perspective, but I don't know if I have a great answer because there's no vaccine yet. I think that's a great answer. As far as um, my assessment, I believe based on how coronaviruses change, that we will have a coronavirus component to an annual flu shot in the future, but maybe I'm wrong. We'll, we'll have to see. But that would be my, my guess based on how, um, how much the vaccine, sorry, the, the virus uh, uh, mutates. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the <laughs> other thing, Jeff, perhaps, and, and please comment on this, is that there are so many teams working collaboratively on the vaccines, on the various ones, that even if it fails, it's not that the whole thing necessarily will fail, so someone can then continue. Uh, because this is what happened with SARS, right? The vaccine was started and then SARS was gone and the vaccine was never really fully tested. I don't think we will have the same situation yet. It yeah. may take longer, but I think we will get there somehow. Yeah, and again, what I, the other thing I might add is that uh, I, I think we're naive to think the vaccine is the only solution. So if you were to ask me, what would I rather have for managing long-term care outbreaks, Tamiflu or the flu vaccine? I'd say, give me Tammy, but I can stop any flu outbreak in a nursing home with Tammy flu because it works very well as a preventative tool. So I'm hoping we get some more very specific antiviral targets will allow us to manage outbreaks and uh, treat people as a pre-exposure prophylaxis or a preventative post-exposure prophylaxis. So I'm hoping we're gonna have a, 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 an armamentarium of different solutions, not just a vaccine. But if you look at the vaccine candidates, again, there's lots of, uh, late press articles or even reviews in, in Lancet and New England Journal about that. I mean, it's incredible the number of types of vaccines and candidates that they have already in, in, in production. I think close to a hundred, no? Yeah, it's amazing. Jeff, um, someone is, I'll, I'll um, ask you this question from the chat box about some vaccines not being safe for people older than 80. And could that be the case with COVID vaccine? Would you know an answer to that? Yeah, so I don't think safety would be my major concern. It would be more so efficacy. And so we probably have to think of a way of uh, using uh, higher doses or adjuvant doses to, to, to drive up the immune response more effectively. And the other reason why we may need an annual shot is just to, to keep antibody levels and protected levels above protective thresholds. So we may need kind of a quote unquote booster every year, even if it's not related to uh, mutation of the, of the virus. Oh, so somebody's asked a question about favipravir. So uh, we're, we're trying to, to do a study on that in long-term care homes. It's, uh, we're just waiting on Health Canada to tell us that's, uh, that's okay, no exception letter. So I'm excited about that as maybe a drug like Tamiflu for prophylaxis in long-term care homes. Okay. Um, great. So I'm wondering, how are you doing, Jeff? Lots of questions coming your way. <laughs> yeah, I can see them coming in in the chat. <laughs> um, maybe we'll we'll answer this, or I'll ask this last question on this slide, and then we'll move to other okay. topics. Um, so can you speak at all about um, what's happening in children, tracking cases or any information that you have about um, COVID in kids? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, the question they're talking about, uh, so they've called it PIMS, I've seen it uh, multi-system inflammatory, sorry, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, so MIS hyphen C. Um, that's that people have been talking about Kawasaki's um, uh, mm -hmm. syndrome in, in children. So I'll talk about that and then I'll talk about incident rate in children. So, so there have been reports of this Kawasaki-like syndrome. So it's not exactly Kawasaki's, it looks a bit different tends to affect more older children, not uh, younger school age children, more kind of late school age and, and high school adolescent children. Um, they've seen cases and the case reports are all in parts of the world that had enormous levels of community transmission. So that makes me think it is likely a very rare event, although I'd be guessing if I could give you an actual um, incidence rate, but it seems the case reports are in uh, you know, uh, the UK, Italy, 
the US, uh, New York, particularly with their very high incidence rates in the community. So I suspect that it is a very rare adverse event. And the only other uh, epidemiology that's been evaluated from case reports is that it does seem to involve more minority populations, particularly black populations, but we're not sure if that's related to the epidemiology of infection of COVID in the United States and the UK that did disproportionately affect uh, some, some uh, groups. Um, it looks like Kawasaki, except it's a bit more prevalent conjunctivitis, um, diffuse rashes, oral lesions, and a very prominent persistent fever that exists that happens after resolution of the viral. It's, a, it's, a, it's a inflammation system's gone awry. So it's responded to the virus and it's gone a bit crazy and cuckoo. So what about incidence rate in children? Um, I'd love to know. Um, we don't have any data in Ontario or even really nationally that would give me a great sense of things. Um, even uh, Sweden who actually allowed their children to go to school and, and who are like these notorious epidemiologists didn't measure <laughs> infection rates in their children. I don't know why they didn't. And I think a big part of it, to be honest, um, is, uh, is nasopharyngeal swabs in children are a real challenge. And we've done some in children. You need like a team of four to hold people down to do, do a nasopharyngeal swab. And so I hope as tools like saliva become more utilized mm -hmm. as, a, as a screening tool, that we might be able to do better epidemiology tests. But I wish I could tell you what do I guess is that incident rates and infection in children, the experiences I've had from the outbreaks I've measured in uh, violence against women shelters is that it was a flash in the pan. They had a fever for a day. I found the virus in one day, it was gone the next. It was very, very quick. And I suspect that's what happens in children and why we're probably underestimating based on virus studies what the true incidence in children is. They may have some protective immunity related to um, uh, uh, regular seasonal coronaviruses. But again, that's just a theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, Susan, if you were wanting to take this last question here in the box uh, about uh, the virus being on RNA, not DNA. And if you would comment on that. Yeah, so for as far as making a vaccine, so the only thing about an RNA virus, they tend to be uh, much uh, sloppier when they're making copies of themselves. And so viruses that have sloppy RNA polymerases, so that's what's the enzyme that's making a copy of their RNA. It, it, I, my analogy I say to people is like, it, it's like a, a typist who, who does uh, 200 words a minute, doesn't give a crap about the mistakes. They're just <laughs> firing away. And so it makes random errors. And anything that makes random errors by chance, you make enough random errors, something might actually be better than the previous. And as a result of that, it can lead to mutations and improve the fitness of the virus and it, it may mute around, mutate around either the immunologic response from the immune system or medications. And so that's the real challenge of RNA viruses. They tend to, to change faster. And that's why it's sometimes more challenging for vaccines, but they are using all, all kinds of interesting strategies to get around this when they're looking at vaccine candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan, let's ask the question because we have received many about the food care. Yeah, so, so here is the story, open. just so you have a bit of background, Jeff. Okay. So first I got a few questions in my blog. People write me after all kinds of things. And all of a sudden I started to get uh, questions from food care nurses because of um, of uh, the directive number two, okay. right? And what's essential service versus not. In any case, we decided with our team to call for a webinar for food care nurses and we have 200 people wow. registered. So this one here represents one of the gazillion questions that we have about when can they attend really to their clients because I mean, it may look like frivolous, but these are nurses that work with patients no. with diabetes usually. Uh, and I'm an no ID one, doctor. No, no, no. I, but I some love, of, I love some my of, good care nurses. My I know, I know, nurses. but one of them wrote to me the other day that the patient tried to do it himself and cut, you know, a bit of his toe. So he was bleeding after. So, you know, so 
that's one if you can answer. And then I really want Jeff, before he goes, Susan, to speak about the issue of masks, please. Okay. Um, the issue of, I know that Jeff has been uh, for a renewal sounding board amongst, uh, alongside with the directives that from the beginning we actually supported of when N95 versus when surgical mask. But what Jeff brings in addition to that, always as all infection control people would, is that the mask is the mask, but what you do to put the mask on and off. Donning and doffing is more important, but also Jeff did a fantastic study. One aspect about Jeff that you all need to know that to me uh, it's worth gold is that he is 24 by seven preoccupied about this stuff. And by that I mean nurses, doctors, uh, everybody that works at Michael Garron and also in other organizations in the OHT. And Jeff, I will quote you on this. You may not remember you said that to me. You were very preoccupied early on about the supplies and the need for supplies, etc. And you said to me, if I don't get ABC, I am going there and I'm going down with my stuff. I remember that and it's really, uh, you know, uh, you are so serious and so real and genuine about protecting your staff. And that's why I wanted to share about the study, but after you answered about the food care nurses. Yeah, so uh, thanks, George. I remember saying that. I always have said to them, if you don't have what you need, I'll go in there with you. So um, I'm a, I, I, I see a lot of diabetic feed infections as an ID doctor. I'm, it, people need to remember I'm actually mostly an infectious diseases doctor and uh, infection prevention control. So my major, one of the major things I see in my practice is diabetic feed. And I have now admitted several clients to the hospital who were unable to receive their usual care. Um, they were able to get debrided. They were able to get their nail care done. A calluses were done and they developed ulcers which have led to admission. So I don't know who deemed that not an essential service, but I think it is an essential service. Um, and I don't know, Doris, we need to, to write somebody and say so, but uh, I can think of two patients in particular, one who might lose their foot because, uh, and I'm sure they'd write a letter too to advocate to say, listen, this is, a, this is a problem. So how do they keep themselves safe? The same way I would say everybody sh should apply universal. So everyone you're in contact with maybe doesn't show signs of COVID, but they might tomorrow. And so you need to treat everybody with the same level of vigilance. So your hands are wet with alcohol-based hand rub. You're just washing them, as Bonnie Henry said, like your chopped jalapenos for dinner. And you, um, you should always wear universal face masks. And I'm a huge believer in face shields. And there's two reasons why I think a face shield is superior to goggles. So the first is, and again, I moved to face shields in my staff, is, I talk to everybody at MGH who tests positive and I talk to them for hours trying to figure out well, what did we do, what could we learn from this, because it sucks you've got it, but the only thing that we can do is actually figure out what to do differently. And so one, um, I can't remember if it was a nurse in RPM was pulling her goggles off and they slipped and they twisted and she kind of self inoculated. And so after that day, I was like, screw it, I'm doing face shields. So face shields don't actually um, touch your eyes, whereas the goggles are right up against your skin. And the other benefit of face shields, I can't touch my face, but I have my face shield on. And so it's a, it, it's a solution to keeping people from futzing with their masks and inadvertently touching their faces, which is why I think the face shield is, is huge. And you can see there's already a, a community push to actually move, use more face shields in the community. There's, uh, a guy, Scott Godlib, who believes they're, they're the answer rather than masks. So I think face shields are important. I would urge all those foot care people who are going to do it to you, universally mask and face shield. And you, you know, the face shield's a nice thing about them. You can are they, them. Are they very difficult to get, comparatively yes, speaking? Um, so uh, what I think, Doris, is that uh, there are lots of places locally that have started producing them, which has opened up the supply chain. This one, like I get mailed, because I was one of the first people 3D printing them. So I get mailed she, these from all over the country that I made this one, what do you think? And so there's lots of great ones being made from Canadian companies now. So I think that from my perspective, 
you could probably find a source of, uh, of face shields. Um, we had a toy company. You remember that game where you put the uh, card in the front of it to guess? Like, I can't remember what it was, bands or something. So they attached to that headband a face shield. And I got a thousand of those, which I've been using in my shelters because uh, we were able to get them for people. So there are lots of innovations around face shields. So I think they're better than some of the other supplies as far as accessing them. Um, but yes, foot care is extremely important for our diabetic patients and also people who, who have neuropathy in general. Okay, so masks. So um, masks is the big debate, right? Um, and what I've tried to say to all my staff is, listen, like uh, I am committed right from the very beginning to try and do what I think is the best to keep you safe. And I would never ask you to do anything I wouldn't do myself. And so there was conflicting evidence in the beginning about whether this was airborne or not, or what conditions led to it to be airborne. But I have spent um, innumerable hours and my colleague, uh, Maureen Taylor wrote a wonderful blog about, uh, on CMAJ, if you're interested, uh, about- uh, We have it there. Yeah, so it, 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 she talked about, she spent like, I don't know, 150, 200, more than that hours in with a, with a, with a, with a droplet mask, providing routine care. And, and it, is, it is safe. Now that I've experienced it, I am 100% comfortable that the major transmission mechanism of this virus is this droplet spread. And I started to reflect on, and again, if I see somebody wearing an N95 mask when I, when I think it's not appropriate, I usually engage them in a conversation because I saw a lot of my colleagues who were, who were scared, right? It was new, it was scary. Many of them had been through SARS and they remembered the experiences of healthcare providers through that time. And they would often put an N95 mask underneath their ear loop and they think I wouldn't notice. So I would go to them and say, you know, I know you've got that on, you know, why don't we talk about it? And it, it it became clear to me when I watched people that how much harder it was to put on and off an N95 mask. And, and I was worried about them for routine care contaminating themselves. And that's why I did this, this video. We, we tested it out with a, with a few nurses. Um, we used eMERGE nurses because I always find they're some of the, the um, smartest but also toughest group to win over because they're usually the most pragmatic and, and practical. So I used one of my eMERGE nurses and I've had one of these conversations with and I said, let's just try it. So we rented from a, uh, from a company that does like dance things. They had a black light and then we, we used this uh, thing called glow germ that, uh, that um, we put on the front of the mask. Now we, we put more probably than, than is actually on a mask. But it just showed that a mask with, with horizontal straps, an N95 mask, putting it on because the straps have to go over top of your head and off is really challenging. And so I urge people not to reuse an N95 mask. If you do need to put one on because you're doing an AGMP, that's when you need it. Put it on, but then when you take it off, you've got to be exceedingly careful when you um, take it off, okay? And um, I would re strongly recommend that you work with your employer to, to not need to reuse an N95 mask. I have real concerns about self-contaminating with that practice. And I think now that we know more about the virus, we, we really can use N95 masks in a, in a smart way to prevent transmission because when, when you need them, you want them. But uh, for the vast majority of cases, the ear loop mask is adequate. And again, people seem to think that ear loop masks don't filter, but both of these masks filter particles of 0.1 to 0.2 microns, like greater than 95. That's where N95 comes from, filtration efficacy. The major difference is this fits tightly around your face so that aerosolized particles, which are free floating in the air, can't slip around any spaces of my ear loop mask. Okay, so that's why an N95 mask is different. They both filter at high efficacy. And because the droplets of, of, of coronavirus, when we're not doing something to aerosolize them are heavy, they fall to the ground and you don't need, they're not gonna go in and around. They don't float freely through the air. And so because you can't see this and because there's conflicting things in the lay press, you know, it, it did require quite a bit of my effort, uh, discussions with frontline staff, 
But, but I truly believe that our frontline, our staff here at MGH now are true believers that the right way to do things is universal face shields. They, they, they love their face shields, universal mask, put it on, don't touch it again until a planned break. And N95 masks should be utilized for, they always need to be available. Nurses and uh, healthcare providers need to do a point of care risk assessment. And if there's an AGMP, get your N95 mask on. But I don't want you to extend the use. So this became a problem in our, our ICU when we were doing AIRVO. So uh, that's a, a high uh, pressure uh, mechanism for providing the oxygen. And um, we found that for individuals with, uh, with ARDS related to coronavirus, rather than intubating them, if we put them on their stomachs and did AIRVO, it seemed to work better. And um, when we changed that, AIRVO is a continuous AGMP. So anyone who enters a room needs an N95 mask. As so we worked with our, our ICU nurses to say, listen, say guys, I don't want you to ever have to put one of these on and off again. So can you do two breaks in a 12 rather than three? And then I'll give you three masks. And that way we can reduce the, the use across the hospital. And that to me is like what this should all be about. It's just this collaboration between teams to get to this end result. I want everyone to be safe and I need to try and use my supplies judiciously. So I have them for when I need them in the future. Well, those are really helpful. So for people, for people that want to see, to know more about this or to show to colleagues, first of all, it, this is taped, so you will be able to have it. But in my blog that the, uh, that is still out till tomorrow, uh, you will see the video. So Jeff wrote a piece for the blog and there is the video that really shows you uh, the difference between the two. And I suggest that you show to colleagues because it's, uh, it's very excellent. It really shows uh, what's happening with one versus the other. And it's so logical, right? It, it makes complete sense, but you can see it and then people can see it. How with the N95, you, you have all the, you know, lights everywhere. So it's fantastic work. Thank you, Jeff. There's a question about cloth masks here, Doris. Can I address the cloth masks? Yes, yes. So absolutely. the one thing I would, uh, so there's a, a couple of things related. And, and don't be shy to say that you started it in East York. No, I remember no, that. And I remember getting emails and phone calls if, if Michael Garron Hospital went crazy to tell people in the public to use the mask, so here you go. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't gonna bring that up, Doris. So, so um, cloth masks, um, I just wanna make it very clear for people, because I did see some disturbing stuff about people using cloth masks for patient care. I wanna make it very yeah, clear no. that cloth masks are only for non-patient facing staff or for the community. So at our institution, um, in order to save my ASTM certified masks, we did move to cloth masks for non-patient facing. So for our finance group, our executive team that are never in front of a patient. And my philosophy with cloth masks is that everybody had a cloth mask on, the number of goobers in the environment is reduced and the probability of us contaminating to each other is low because about 50% of the hospital outbreaks, maybe even high 75 are driven by healthcare worker illness to healthcare worker illness. Mm -hmm. we get in the break room, we haven't seen friends and we're starved for attention. We hang out with our friends at work and we get too close and we spread COVID. So that was my, my desire to do that, is save some of my STM masks for frontline staff because at the beginning of this, they were very hard to come by. And uh, so that's what I, what I started. And then I said, you know what, why just the hospital? It needs to be all of East York. And so I, I challenged my community to, to make masks. And I think I asked for, what I asked for 10,000 to start, Doris, and they gave me like 100,000 by now, like amazing, oh, amazing response. And what I do with those masks is, so I give them to my shelters, I give them to my other healthcare partners when they need to, to mask a group to, to increase services. And uh, we even let our staff choose some that they, they like the design. When you go down to our dialysis unit, it's amazing to see everyone's got like a, you know, Superman pajama, a mask and all these different pattern masks in the dialysis suite. So at, at MGH, nobody's um, nose or mouth is showing, um, mm -hmm. um, only in their offices or if they're doing a teleconference like this. And the so, side effect of that also, I think is important in terms of building community because we have, 
you had all these people in the community that wanted to help in some way or another, and what a beautiful way in addition to the benefit of the mask itself for them to feel that they're contributing. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the 3D printing too, I didn't know how many people have 3D printers, but we got like 10,000 3D printed uh, um, uh, head, uh, head shields as well. So, so the, the, the other thing about cloth masks is that uh, the same way that you have to know how to use an ear loop mask. And again, this is where I think, you know, I, I, I'm not a public health resourced individual. Um, I do think we need more public health education about how these masks are used in the public. Um, again, this is where I struggle with, you know, I'm an infectious disease doctor on the ground in a single hospital. And how do I promote the appropriate lives? I see them under people. You know, John Tory wears it underneath his chin. Did you see, did you see his <laughs> apology last night? I did. did you see his yeah. apology? Yeah. That yeah. was beautiful, actually. I, I think it was so beautiful. Too. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, Jeff, I just want to ask, because we do have yeah. a question around, I trust you then would support mandatory wearing of masks when in public. So uh, you may not know, Billy, but I, I hate mandatory. <laughs> I, I, I find that uh, it, it leads to challenges when you force people to do yes, things. Yes. And so um, I, I'm a believer that if you provide enough information and there's enough political will, I talk about a wave of success taking over the people who don't believe in it. Yeah. I believe, yeah. Uh, I wanted to tweet out to Drake, can you, Drake, can you please make masks cool? Because we can get the majority of society wearing them. I promise you the pendulum will swing and everyone else will start to wear them. So mm -hmm. I'm a little bit hesitant about these mandatory policies. I don't know if it will drive change as much as us trying to push yeah. the majority and influential people to wear them. I'd love every influential Torontonian to, sh you know, to, to design their coolest mask and, and, and sell them and go to charity, right? Like do something mm -hmm. to drive masks as being cool. That's what we need uh, more of. Okay, then you need to so see that my we need mask. an RNO mask. <laughs> Here's <laughs> my mask. An RNO mask. Yeah. Get it. on the uh, design. So, so I'm looking at the time. Um, Jeff, you've answered the majority of these but questions. But before he goes, we need to do this. Okay. Yes, um, we need to cheer. How is it not 7.30? It's past 7.30. It's past 7.30, past 7 .30, but we will fake it. We will fake it. <laughs> so I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, well, Jeff, this has been highly interesting oh, and great. extremely helpful. Um, I think RNAO can answer a lot of um, the leftover questions that haven't been addressed. Um, so I'll, I think we can, we can close the question and answer period and come to our cheering. Unless, unless Jeff has time and he wants to stay. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, I, I've got to go figure out uh, what you want me to work on, Doris. <laughs> so we need to open okay, up the Okay, let's panel. do this. Olivia. Yeah, we've got lots of people saying that they want to participate, so that's great. Yeah. So just give Olivia a moment or two. Yeah. And, I haven't experienced uh, this before. Here, the, be great. here they all come. Here we go. Did you well, I might get a tear in my eye. It always brings me a tear when I see people do this when I come home. So, <laughs> no, we, will, we will say today, cheers, cheers to all healthcare workers and in particular to Jeff Powis yeah. for giving us so much information and being available. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. okay ready. But, but, but people have the mics off. Yes. Where's your mic? Yeah. Get your mic is off. Yeah, get your mic off. Yeah. Sure. Yes, Betsy, put your mic on. There we go. Olivia, your mic. Okay, I can hear you now. Mic <laughs> But I'm not on. Oh, okay. I'm oh, Andre, we can Miranda. see and hear you. Oh. Yeah. Good show. There's Liz. Jeff, we had well over 200 people uh, with us tonight. Okay, but please put the mic on, Olivia. Yeah, she's Hi, Doris. Put your mic, mic on. on. Okay, and Barb Anderson, there's Barb. That's great to see you tonight. And we've got full screen, so we can. All right. We got oh, multiple okay. screens. Okay, you ready? ready. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> health care workers. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
amazing, guys. Thank you. And thank thank you. you. All the collaboration. <laughs> honestly, it, it's how we're going to get through this. So thank yeah, you. That's right. Thank, thank you. you. So okay. Bye. 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 Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 What the pleasure of a person, huh? Oh. Amazing. But you, you don't understand. Is you send him a question, and I think three minutes after you have an answer or a phone call. Now it goes both ways, but there is there is so many awesome people that if it's not for COVID, I mean, in fact, that day, uh, Susan, is when we went to do the training at um, Michael Guerin for the OHT. Yeah, I remember, yeah. And I came, so I came, I don't know if you remember, but you were, I think you may have been, Olivia, remember my reaction? So here I am. I yeah. came yeah. all frazzled. I don't come frazzled very often. I was pissed off about whatever I heard in the radio. And I said to people, tell them it's not low risk. Tell them it's not low risk. This is never low risk. And we need to get ready and we need to tear it up. And then Olivia tells me, um, the chief of infection control wants to speak with you on the break. <laughs> and I said, Olivia, did I get in trouble? for saying that this is not low risk. That was good. <laughs> no, though, Jeff I was on that. the same page and Jeff wanted to talk, what are we going to do to move people, to move people, right? And it was from the beginning also the discussion about N95 versus surgical mask. And he is very evidence-based mm -hmm. and yeah. just an amazing human being. But when he said, if, if, if I don't get what I need for the stuff, I'm going down with them. I'm going there. And like, you yeah. know, a, a true, true um, leader, community leader, community leader, you know, not ivory tower, community leader like nobody else. And people just adore him in this, uh, in this OHD. Yeah. Very good. Okay, okay. With, that in, with that in mind, all back to you, Susan, to put questions. You're mute, you're mute. Okay, yeah, so Doris, I think we'll call this to a close and follow up with other questions and other content for next week. Very okay. good, perfect. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody, good night. Yes, good Thank night. You. Good session, Susan, Doris, Heather, bye. Thank you, guys, take care. Great. Great event.